outwit, outlast, outplay was the famous payoff line of the popular TV series Survivor. Now, doesn't that just aptly capture the state of play in the DA over the past two years? Pawns, knights, bishops, heck, even queens and kings have fallen by the wayside and new ones are on the game board now. But is the DA so engrossed in its own palace politics on debates on whether or not race is a proxy for disadvantage in South Africa on who is a true liberal and who isn't to its detriment? What message does a, a, such a party besieged by troubles at some of its councils that it runs take to the electorate? DA head of policy, Gwen Gwenya, joins me now for my opening gambit. Gwen, thank you for coming through. Um, <laughs> let me start here. Uh, last I checked, you had left the position of head of the policy unit in the DA. I didn't see the announcement that you were returning. What happened? I mean, when you left, you had some damning things to say about whether or not your role was being taken seriously and whether or not you were enjoying the support of the leadership in the DA. Um, what happened? When did you come back and how? Well, of course, I had um, penned that um, you know, resignation letter outlining the political and operational difficulties which made the job difficult to do at the time, which unfortunately made its way into the public domain. But that was so that the leadership could apply its mind as hard to improve the policy process in the future. Of course, after that resignation, other events unfolded. Um, but essentially, I mean, to cut the long story short, as recently I was approached and to say that, well, if these things were fixed, would you be able to come on board and to continue the job that you had started? And I've always been, you know, um, very eager to contribute to the South African political um, you know, landscape in the way that I can. And so given the opportunity and space to do so, I, of course, was willing to, um, to make myself available. If you believed the previous leadership did not take policy seriously, the change of leadership, I assume, uh, was a big factor uh, in your decision to come back. Well, for me, it wasn't just about personalities. It was about clear commitments um, on paper about how the policy process was going to go out, that there would be firstly a policy process, that, pa that party structures would be engaged um, in policy, and that at the end we would be able to announce policy outcomes that were both the subject of a principal discussion but also were backed by evidence-based um, research. So today you released your discussion document ahead of your policy congress in April um, and in it you focus on the values of the DA and a lot of people don't understand uh, it may seem like a peripheral issue but actually in the DA this is critical isn't it the values defining who you are so how are you defining yourself right now? Yeah. Well just to step back a little bit I would think this is important to the country at large you know any political party that wants to make an offer to the people of South Africa has to be able to say these are the values and principles principles against which we hope to measure ourselves and that we invite you also to hold our conduct accountable um, against and also from which to use the point of departure for any future policy positions because that is what guarantees policy coherence when you say that you are com committed to X value and then your policies clearly flow from those particular um, you know, value foundations. So what we've released today is a, largely I would call a reaffirmation of the DA's values and principles because it has always been a values based party but it's important before you engage in a policy uh, process to almost do a kind of sanity check to say right these are the values values that we hold dear, are we on common ground or common understanding as to what each of these terms mean? Because I guarantee you now, every party in the political landscape uses words like non-racialism, right? But do they ever define them? Does, does you know, when, when one person or one politician use that word, does it mean the same thing as when another politician? I don't think so. So I think it's quite important to state quite clearly what yeah. we mean by these particular So into that mix you add such things as constitutionalism and the rule yes. of law, social um, as, as a social market economy. I mean, that was an interesting one, um, as opposed to you stating it as a free market economy. Is that a yeah. well, conscious that's, decision or that's a very that, conscious. Is, is it just you know, a, a better phrasing for you? It's a very conscious decision because the concept of a free market economy implies that it's completely kind of hands-off and the market must just, um, you know, just have this um, um, completely just market-based approach. Whereas we fundamentally do believe that government has a role to play, but that role is defined and limited. 
The extent of government inv involvement in the private sector should be, in fact, to enhance how the market economy mm. works, which is to promote open uh, markets and to promote competition, not to hinder those things. And quite often when government has got involved in the economy, it's to hinder competition and, and open markets as opposed to enhance them. So when you're hearing that, there's talk of the possibility of um, government you know, moving in the direction, as was announced by Gweda Mandashe, of a separate generate, a power generating company uh, outside of ESCOM, perhaps working with the, uh, the private sector. How does that land with you? In well, I think context. that absolutely defies then the values of the social market economy because in, particularly in cases where you don't want to get involved are cases where um, the market can probably fulfill that role better. So we're not saying, I mean, you know, just to touch on this particular issue very quickly, I don't think anyone is saying that the government needs to step out of the game um, absolutely entirely, perhaps unlike the situation with SAA where we think it's a complete luxury to have a state-owned airline. In the case of, um, you know, electricity and energy, there perhaps is a role for the state to play, but there certainly should be much greater involvement of independent um, players in that space as well. So I don't believe you were surprised, though, that in as much as you wanted it to be about the values and uh, principles discussion documents, Document. Uh, your media briefing ended up moving far along uh, into, into the next set of documents you'll be releasing and the whole issue around economic justice policy, which is what you, you are terming it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a debate that's been raging in the DA. So you said something at the briefing that I found quite interesting around this debate that's been raging about whether or not race is a proxy for disadvantage in South Africa. Uh, and that's been raging in the DA for a while. Before I throw this to you, let's take a listen to what uh, the DA's uh, federal council chairperson and Helen Zille had to say about that uh, a few months ago as she was making her comeback into politics. Some people say race must be a proxy for disadvantage. Others, other of us say no, disadvantage doesn't need a proxy. You can measure disadvantage. So disadvantage can be measured in and of itself using race as a proxy for disadvantage has always led to the empowerment of a few politically connected people, leaving the vast majority of disadvantaged people behind. So, Gwen, if you accept that, you know, disadvantage, uh, race was a factor uh, in the circumstances that led to many black South Africans being disadvantaged today, uh, how are you going to address disadvantage that was based on race without actually acknowledging race in the interventions that you are putting in place? Yeah. Well, firstly, I, I must make the comment as the head of policy or, you know, the policy unit, our role is to table or place the policy options before the party. It is the party itself that will actually then amend, adopt or vote on policies as it sees fit, the delegates at that particular conference. So it's not my role particularly to take a view, but to present the options. Now, since the party already has a, a standing policy position, which... Um, I suppose it can fall back to, the task now is to present an alternative. Um, and essentially what that one will propose, and this is where you are saying, unfortunately, also the discussion went there, but the, whereas this was about our values and principles and the economic justice policy is still to follow. But just to highlight it very briefly, it takes the point of departure by saying what are the actual disadvantages that people face. So let's not get into some academic, esoteric discussion about whether race is a proxy for disadvantage or not. As an ordinary person, what you care about are the material disadvantages that you experience. So so you care about the fact that you, your, your children might experience stunting because you cannot afford to give them a diet that is of high nutrition or that is varied enough to allow for um, early childhood um, development. You care about the education that they're getting, that they have educational outcomes which prepares them for the future. You care about the spatial inequalities that you still experience because of the apartheid divides that were put in place. So we're saying you can actually name all the disadvantages and outline the disadvantages that people face. And our task then as a political party is to say, what are we going to do about those disadvantages? So that is the approach the redress policy takes, is to outline the concrete disadvantages faced right. and the policy solutions that align with them. I have to ask you about the ugly spats we've been seeing on social media um, with your former leader, Musa Maimane, um, and the current leader, uh, John Stianazen, uh, Musa Maimane, you know, responding to a report, a news report about, uh, you know, what John Stianazen said about his 
leadership tenure in the DA and in the process calling him Judas uh, and in the process then uh, people like uh, uh, Khaleb Kachalia getting involved and you know entering the fray. Surely that doesn't help you with the vehicle that you are hoping will carry your policies, Gwen? Well, you know, my view of these things is that at the end of the day, I think, you know, whether it's um, you're talking about Maimane or you're talking about, um, you know, the current interim leader, we're all just people who believe that we have a vision that has something to offer South Africans. And the role is just to put that before South Africans and let South Africans choose. So it's not my role to disparage, you know, one person's approach to that. So I'm not going to, um, you know, almost Yeah, but you did say that Musa Maimane caused policy confusion in the DA. No, I did not. In fact, I, I try to very rarely respond to um, such provocations on social media and to kind of be above the fray. But that one was important for me to clarify to say that that in fact, that headline had no relationship to the actual quote itself. So it was a reporter who, in fact, said, the former leader of your party left due to policy uncertainty. And I said them straight, and I said, no, he did not leave because of policy uncertainty, which he would have been responsible for as the leader. He left due following a report right. uh, of that review panel. Gwen? So those are not my words. Thank you. Thank you for coming through. Uh, I'm completely Pleasure. out of time. Gwen Gwenya is the head of the policy unit in the Democratic Alliance. Next, in the state of play, advocate Moses Kaka, and it talks to me about representing clients deemed by some to be rogues. It may be part of his professional obligation, but as you'll, as you'll hear from him, he tells me there is actually a set of principles that underpin why he does what he does.